Hi, I'm Marie Mushing, and you're watching Pick Talk TV live from Hamilton. Well, we have a great show lined up for you today. We have some fabulous guests in the studio. Uh, we have Jill Lockhart from National Records Management. We have Andrea Maxson from who is a naturopathic doctor with us. We have Francis Fosher, who is with Francis Fosher Photography. And we also have Brian Owen, who is filling in for Dot High with the Mountain Theatre News. We have some great events that are happening around the Hamilton area right now. Um, right, we have the Women Who Excel Business Card Bingo, and that's going to be happening from CanWeb Printing in Grimsby, and that's tomorrow evening. We have the Women Entrepreneurs Meetup Group. That's Wednesday, on the 18th. That's at the Bay Gardens Funeral Home at 9 a.m. in Hamilton. Thursday, July 19th, we have the Like-Minded Business Network in Burlington, and that's at the Beaver and Bulldog, and that's also another meetup event. On Thursday, July 26th, is Breakfast with Fran, and that's at the Bedrock Bistro at 8 a.m. And of course, our PicTalk TV Niagara show is going to be airing Friday, July 27th, from the Community Center in Niagara on the Lake. So my first guest this morning is Jill Lockhart from National Records Management. Now Jill is talking to us today about preparing your company for a disaster and the components that go into the recovery. So right. welcome. Thank you. Thanks good for coming in, Jill. Well, it's good to be here. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. So your company has been in business for a long time. Yes. Yes. Now this, I understand this is a family run company. Yes, we are. Okay. Family owned and operated yes. into the fourth generation now, actually. Oh, fabulous. So it said that the, your company was in business for 60 years and now this is a division of it. Yes. So. Yes. This is a new division um, that actually just celebrated its fifth anniversary. Okay. And Excellent. Pretty excited about that. Oh, I bet. I bet. And it's a service, of course, that's very well needed in this community. Yes, definitely. Now, tell me, um, how did your company get this startup? What, what prompted this? Well, basically, after being in business for as long as we had, um, we had a lot of files of our own that we needed to do something with, and took a look around and realized that there was a huge need for all the other businesses in the entire Niagara region and the Hamilton area, mm -hmm. and we saw an opening and figured we could help some people out. Excellent. So now tell me, like with the advent of digital media, mm -hmm. how has that affected record storage and management? Digital media is is a new facet to things yes. um, because it's very tempting for a lot of people to say, well, we're going to scan everything and keep it as a digital archive. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to it than most people realize, yes. Marie, and the problem is that you run into, well, first of all, after you scan them, you still have the paper. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Can you actually get rid of it and destroy it? Yes. Or are you going to maybe need it later down the road to make sure you scan it accurately? Mm -hmm. There's also the issue of what form are you going to store it in? What if you put it all on CDs? Are we going to be using those in 20 years? Yes. So there, there is a, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, digital media is great mm -hmm. for things that are going to be in use all the time. Yeah. For things that you just need to keep and have a record of, paper is still the best way to store things. Okay. Um, and most cost effective as well. So. Excellent. Okay, so now, first of all, let's talk about then what happens for a disaster. What is classified as a disaster for your company? Well, <laughs> when you hear the word disaster, everyone thinks volcanoes, earthquakes, yeah, something horrible, yeah. hurricanes, and in the Niagara region, most people think, well, chances of that happening here are slim. I believe a hurricane yeah. did hit a few decades ago, but um, it's it can be even more mundane than that. What if your server crashes? Right. What if the power goes out? And that happened to a lot of people a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, what if someone breaks in yeah. and steals things? And so it can encompass encompass that whole gamut yeah. of things, basically. Yeah, exactly. And, and then once again, it goes back to that digital age, you know, of your, your server <laughs> going down and, you know, the power failure and things not working. And as we rely so much on technology. When you flip that power button, it better fire up. It better. So what is it that you do then when you go in to help a company prepare for a disaster? Um, well, every company is different for so and what they need, mm -hmm. depending what products and services they offer. But basically, we have a template that we use, and I brought one to show everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, what we walk companies through is, first of all, figure out 
what your risk of a disaster is. Like yeah. which, which ones are you most likely to be susceptible to? Mm -hmm. And then what is going to happen if that actually does occur? Right. And so that involves taking a look at how are your day-to-day -day operations going to be affected? Okay. Um, what is the monetary component of that? But also, more so than that, what steps do you need to put in place then mm -hmm. at that point? And that's where really it gets very company specific and some people like to you know, put things together on their own. Sometimes yeah. we can provide expertise because there is a records component mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Uh, things burn or flood uh, and you have paper or electronic backup tapes, mm -hmm. it gets a little bit grim. Yes. Um, and so we really just we really just guide people to start to think about the problem because they're the ones that know their business. Yeah. And they're the ones that have to put that plan in place. And it is the majority of the investment companies are going to make is time. Yes. And they have to put that time in. And so mm -hmm. our, our toolkit or our template um, basically asks a lot of questions that you hadn't really thought of. Yeah. Oh, oh, that could be a problem. That's right. And so it really just makes you think about what can go wrong yeah. and how to prevent it. Yeah, exactly. Now, when you're going out and you're talking to companies, do you find that there's very many that actually have that plan in place? No, there's not. Yeah. And that's a little bit scary um, because statistically, every company in five years is going to experience some sort of disaster. Yeah. Once again, it may not be a volcanic eruption, mm -hmm. but a server crash, someone breaking yep. in and stealing, say, credit card receipts belonging to your clients. That gets pretty sticky pretty quickly as well. Yes. And most people, they thought it'll happen to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and they just haven't gotten around to it, yeah. they haven't thought it was worthwhile, or that it was too expensive to do. Yes, of course. So. I, and, and I understand that totally, being in the, the computer-related yeah. business. You know, we, we hear of that all the time. You know, a client comes in, you know, my husband's an IT person, and, you know, they come in, oh, my computer crashed, can you help me? Well, the first question is, do you have your files backed up? It's like, no, you have to We're save them. That. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it, as I say, and I find the, the small business sector, we're the least prepared, yet we have the biggest need and to make sure because we're everything. That's true. Yeah. And small businesses are actually more highly targeted by identity thieves than larger ones yeah. for that very reason. Mm -hmm. They haven't put that plan in place and the security yeah. measures. Yeah, exactly. So what, what's the best thing a business should do right now to minimize that disaster when it happens? You've got to have that plan in place. Yeah. You have to know mm -hmm. what you're going to do and also prepare financially for mm -hmm. it. For example, if you know something could cost you $100,000, and you have a 20% chance of that happening, mm -hmm. basically leave $20,000 in your yearly budget to allow for that because that way you're not at risk of a bankruptcy if something happens. And That's it's that true. preparation beforehand that in terms of any disaster is going to make a difference. Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the things that your company can do then is come in and help them with to get their manual together to mm -hmm. have their pre preparation kit. And, and the other thing I would say on that is when you have a plan in place, test it. Yes. Practice to know if something happens, who am I going to call? What employees are going to do what? And that will alleviate a lot of problems when something actually does happen. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jill, for coming much. in today. Thank you very much. How can people contact you? Um, well, our website, uh, which I believe is up there, but it is www.nrmcanada.com. Um, you can also call us, 905 563-0847. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. So some very excellent information there. And get your you know, recovery, recovery plan in place. So my next guest this morning is Andrea Maxim, who is a naturopathic doctor. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And how are you today, Andrea? Doing very well, keeping my health on track, and that's really what the goal is for all of my patients. Yeah, exactly. And, and I find in this hot weather, too, it seems harder for a lot of people to keep that on track. It is. Yeah. It is. And usually if we just stick to the basics, drinking lots of water and, and keeping cool, we can get through it quite yeah. easily. Yeah, exactly. Now, you have your own practice, I understand, she's in Caledonia, and you also work out of the Oakville region as well. Yes. Excellent. So that must keep you very busy. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, Andrea, tell me, how do people choose a naturopathic doctor? Like, how did you get into this line of work yourself? 
So we'll start with how I got into it. I always wanted to be a doctor ever since the age of five, mm -hmm. but I always wanted to be a doctor that could really sit down and talk to my patients, really understand where their complaints and their concerns were coming from, and really be able to develop a relationship with my patients. Mm -hmm. um, the knowledge that I gained as a naturopathic doctor has really allowed me to do that, as well as treat using diet and lifestyle recommendations, mm -hmm. acupuncture, herbs, and with regards to finding a naturopathic doctor, what I recommend all of our viewers to do is to go to uh, www.oand.org, which is the Ontario Association of Naturopathic Doctors, and it lists all of the licensed registered naturopaths in the area, and then you can find one close to you. Yes, and hopefully that would be you. Hopefully <laughs> it would be me, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so what is the primary goal? What is the goal for a naturopathic? So as a naturopathic doctor, it's our goal to not only address the symptoms that our patients are coming in with, but to determine why those symptoms have um, presented themselves. Mm -hmm. So we like to try to find the root cause of those issues. So I firmly believe that the body can heal itself in any means necessary, but if there's obstacles to cure, and what I mean by that is if our stress levels are really high, if we don't have enough nutrients, mm -hmm. if we're eating foods that are causing inflammation in the body, if we don't remove those obstacles, the body's going to have a very difficult time getting back on track on its own. Yes. But by determining that root cause, generally our patients respond very quickly to treatment mm -hmm. and usually have long-lasting health and that's kind of the whole purpose. Yeah, exactly. So do, so do you find that, that you gain patients where the conventional medicine fails them? I do and simply because we are offered the freedom to really sit with our patients for about 30 minutes to as much as two hours and address a lot of the questions that they have. Unfortunately with conventional medicine because they're so busy they don't always have the time right. to sit down and talk to their patients. Naturopathic medicine has that opportunity to really answer questions and concerns and educate our patients on how the body works and what could potentially be going on. Once patients become empowered with their health, they're more likely to continue to achieve optimal health outside the clinic, and that's really what we want. Okay, so when that first patient comes to you, what's the procedure when they first come to your office? Yeah, so what we always ask our new patients to do is to fill out an intake form, and the intake form is detailed, it's about four pages long, but the reason why is because we need to get an entire view of how, of how that person is presenting on okay. that particular mm -hmm. day, and then it allows our first appointment to go a lot more streamlined and start treatment right away. Our first visit is about an hour and a half or an mm -hmm. hour long, depending on which clinic you go to, okay. and that allows us to really get uh, a relationship going and get a good treatment plan in place. And after that, it's about a half an hour visit at a time. And it's just follow-ups to make sure that the patients are um, understanding everything and everything's going well. Okay, very good. So what tests then do you run when you're diagnosing a patient to choose the best treatment to assist them? Now, I firmly believe that the more lab testing we do, the better I am at treating my patients because I have a lot more data at my fingertips. Mm -hmm. We are actually able to requisition any lab work that a medical doctor can requisition, okay. except patients will find that they're paying out of pocket for that because we're not covered under OHIP. Okay. But above and beyond that, we do food allergy testing, salivary hormone testing to make sure our hormones are in balance. We can test heavy metals in the hair. We can test for any infections that are going on. You mm -hmm. name it. As long as it helps us get to our goal, we can do it. Oh, fabulous. Mm -hmm. So what methods do you use then to treat your patients? I find that for the most part, I stick to the basics. Okay. So if we can get people eating right, sleeping right, digesting right, pooping right, moving right, mm -hmm. all those things, then the body will easily fall back into balance. If we don't address all of those basic components, it's going to be a lot harder for us to get where we want to go as quickly as we want to go. Because I always believe that patients want to get better yesterday. Of course. So I try to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. and I think sometimes when they, by the time they get to you, they are desperate because mm -hmm. no one else has been able to give them those answers. Absolutely. 
But when people do come to you, what would what, what be the most common ailments that a person would come to you for to be treated? So for me specifically, I do a lot of hormone balancing. So I've been getting a lot of women with menopause and hot flashes. I've been getting some women coming in with fertility issues. I also treat a lot of digestive complaints because we're just not absorbing our foods as easily as we were um, a long time ago. And the soil is a lot different. And then I do treat pediatrics as well. So okay. young kids with mm -hmm. ADHD or autism. I've actually had a few Lyme disease cases recently. So okay, it's been yeah. a, a huge variety of, of complaints yeah. that come in. Wow. Well, I'm sure that, you know, it sounds to me like you, your practice is growing and yes. it's going to get even bigger because it seems where the conventional medicine doesn't have all the answers anymore yeah. to a lot of the things. And I find a lot of the things are very environmental. So, so that's wonderful. Andrea, thank you so much yes. for coming into the studio and sharing this with me today. How can people contact you? The best way to contact me is to visit my website, www.andreamaximnd.com or you can call me at 1-888-375-3111. That's good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So if you have some questions and you'd like a naturopathic doctor to answer them, contact Andrea for some more information. And my next guest today, Francis Fischer from Francis Fischer Photography. Good morning, Francis. Welcome morning. to the show. Thank you very much. Now, today we're going to be talking about presenting the finer points of, of quality architectural photography. Um, but first of all, Francis, tell me a little bit about how it is that you got involved with this. You've been doing this for 30 years now, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I studied at mm -hmm. uh, Ryerson. I worked as a commercial photographer. Well, I studied at Ryerson, and then I worked as a, an assistant, and I learned, uh, as a f trained as a food photographer mm -hmm. initially. And I worked in a number of different studios throughout uh, southern Ontario and uh, in Toronto. Yes, you have quite a, a broad in history in the industry. Uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And then about maybe about 15 years ago, I started doing more um, architectural interiors, a lot of work with the uh, high-end cabinet makers mm -hmm. and, and architects. And, and so yes. today, I'd say maybe 80% of my work is, is architectural. And so we're that's looking at kind of the difference between architectural photography and the real estate photography that you see. Oh, of course, yes. So, and I can tell from you know the pictures I've seen on your website um, that you have a real passion for for your for your business. So that's wonderful. Now, okay. Francis, tell me, how has the digital photography age challenged your business? In what way? The um, digital was was is it, it's obviously it's a big thing. We don't use the we don't use film anymore. That's long gone. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, we don't. Um, but the end products are always the same. I mean, it's, it's ink on paper, it's a pretty yes. page. Mm -hmm. And so really what digital has changed is the workflow to get to that point. We always, mm -hmm. as a professional, you know what you want as a finished product. Mm -hmm. And digital allows you different methods of getting to that. And some, some allow for different, different processes. Okay. You know, we don't light the same way we used to. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of photography now is done in multi layers, so right. that we can get the best of each aspect in the image, and then layer it up and, and put okay. it together. So that was a little bit different mm -hmm. from from when we were using film. Uh, I see. Okay. Now today we're talking about the finer points of architectural photography, and I know we have some wonderful images um, that we're going to take a look at, so people can see some of the examples while we're talking on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to bring up the first image here, and of course you've been working a lot in Hamilton these days too. So yes, I know. I've, I've, yeah. we've, I've lived in Hamilton mm -hmm. since 2006, mm -hmm. and uh, my clientele is split between Hamilton and, and mm -hmm. Toronto, but okay. mostly southern Ontario, and I'm trying to get more yeah. work in here. Um, this image is um, of the pedestrian bridge that uh, crosses the um, for, for the Queen uh, yes. W. And I've never seen it look like this. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> this was done for architectural uh, landscape services in Hamilton, but it was also used by the architect and uh, the engineering firm. And the engineering firm uh, entered it in, in some uh, engineering awards, which they did win. Um, this. Again, there's a magic hour just before, just after dawn, and 
around dusk. And right. so there's no direct light that comes on this bridge because the sun comes up on one end of the bridge and right. sets at the other end of the bridge. So you have to deal with, with what you've got. And mm -hmm. these are fine examples of, um, of coming in. And this was photographed over a period of uh, four or five days okay. and it was done at various uh, morning and evening mean, yeah. sessions. Fabulous, fabulous shots. Um, the next, I think, um, the next image was, uh, is uh, showing perspective control. This one is done from um, McMaster University. Okay. And it's the new engineering building. And mm -hmm. what Beautiful. you'll notice is that when we look, because because a camera looks up at a building, yeah. the bottom part of that building is always wa looks wider yes, on the camera. It does, yeah. But in architectural um, photography, what we need to do is we need to straighten that out. Right. So there's there's perspective control is involved in in these, and then the other aspect is also that we're yeah. using lenses and equipment that allow for straight lines to come across yeah. as straight lines, whereas some of the the zoom lenses that you would find in the uh, on the market tend to put every puts a curve on everything. Yeah. And with with architectural photography, we're looking for straight lines. To yeah. Be and I'm finding this the, this image line. itself is a very like a three dimensional look to it. So. Well, that again it is part and parcel of of lighting, mm -hmm. and whether it's natural lighting or whether it's artificial lighting, mm -hmm. the lighting is what gives a two-dimensional thing, a photograph, okay. a three-dimensional quality to it. And I, in some Lighting of the other photographs, when we go into the kitchens, I always put lights in behind to, to separate, like in, separate an aisle. Okay. We'll get, we'll get sure, into yeah, we'll have a look at one of those later. So uh, again, this is late afternoon. It's a mm -hmm. residential home uh, in Toronto, um, which that was six just yeah it's just the afternoon and again working with perspective control and, mm -hmm. and using the shadows to yeah. give and, the and very dramatic with the shadows some kind in of the depth. picture this uh, here is um, a similar instance uh, this is um, down on the waterfront mm -hmm. in Hamilton, in Hamilton. here yeah. and it involved bringing lights in at dusk mm -hmm. using the rich color of that sky and showing the, the outline of that building. The, the photographs need to tell a story. Yeah. I mean, that's what photographs of essentially course, do. Of course. And so, and this is the other side. And the other side of the same and building. And it has yeah. again. It was early morning or late evening uh, light to give the, the dimensionality to that building. Yeah, exactly. And and that's and that's fabulous. Now this I found a very interesting image. It's the National Arts Center, yeah. and it's just a detail, or an architectural detail mm -hmm. of the roof and um, the structures, the, the flags that they have up there. This is the um, Christ the King Cathedral here in Hamilton, mm -hmm. and it's part of a, a bigger project. I did that as actually as a, um, it was their 75th anniversary a couple of years ago, and we did that photograph much in the um, in the style of Frederick Evans, who was a photographer in England, mm -hmm. um, photographing all of the Norman and Gothic cathedrals in England and France. And I've, I've loved his work. I, I've yeah. always uh, an appreciation for Evans and, and the kind of work that he did. And he did this in the late 17th century, early 18th century. Yes, and I find the black and white can be just so stunning. Yes. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen some of his original prints. This is a kitchen that, that I was, one of the kitchens yeah. I was talking about. This was done in Oakville. This uh, kitchen, the millwork throughout the whole home, the, the people had, mm -hmm. they spent about $2 million on the, right. just on millwork alone. There were three, three different companies doing the, um, the millwork. But some of this is the lighting, again, that gives you that three-dimensionality. Mm -hmm. I always put a light behind the island. This one was a bit yes. of a challenge. It had a two-inch... Uh, cherry glue up on one island and then it had white marble everywhere else and with a white kitchen you don't if 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 it's lit flat it just it just it's, dies yeah it's just a white kitchen so you have to you <laughs> have to really it. introduce this photograph here shows off the the detail and, and, that's and right. my client in this in this case is the the builder the the one who manufactured the, mm -hmm. the yep. Miranda kitchens 
and they manufactured the millwork here. And so you really will want to light it so that you show the detail mm -hmm. and you show the craftsmanship and also tell the story and give a, a three-dimensional quality yeah. to that. And, and which, of course, was very well done because the very instant I looked at these photographs, that was the first thing that struck me when I looked at them was, wow, look at the detail. So yeah, and I see that in, in some of the advertising uh, in some of the local papers here in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. the, the, I'm sure they're excellent craftsmen, but the photography was, it looks like it was done yeah. with a cell phone. And they're buying pages in, you know, the advertising in, in the magazine has mm -hmm. got to be worth Oh. A dollar, well, yes, and a lot of money. And, and not their product, their, their the quality and their craftsmanship mm -hmm. in their product yeah. just seems yeah. to die. Mm -hmm. and, and this is beautiful. This is, again, this is a, going from very white to a very dark image. In in terms of home renovation, the wine cellar is now becoming the next big thing. Yes. And so what we did here was we lit it so that we could again show the craftsmanship and the detailing mm -hmm. in the in the actual work, but we still wanted to keep it keep the mood. Yeah. And keep it, you know, dark. Wine cellars are, are normally course, dark yeah, places. Very dark. I've just finished working with uh, with another photographer, and we're uh, we have a book called the uh, Spectacular Wineries and Boutique Wineries of Ontario, and that'll be coming out. The publisher is Panache out of Texas, and that'll be um, that'll come out in the fall. Okay. And we photographed all of the wineries in in Ontario, actually, mm -hmm. but specifically I did worked on the ones in Niagara and Point Pelee. And so I've been Fabulous. photographing wine cellars for mm -hmm. a little bit. This was done for another uh, millwork uh, company. It's mm -hmm. a uh, private library. And uh, again, and same thing. Same. With dark woods, we find that we really have to punch in a lot of light to bring out the detail and yes. to bring, you know, because that, that dark wood really absorbs yeah. light. And, and these pictures just bring out that richness of that wood. Uh -huh. Thank you. The commercial, the commercial photography, the commercial yes. photography yeah. for uh, uh, franchisee. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The next one Still? is done for the guy, the designer guys. The next yeah. two are done for the designer guys over at HGTV. Oh, okay, fabulous. And it, and again, lots of detail, lots of beautiful lighting. Without the lighting glaring back at you. Right. You're, catch, you're still catching that detail, which I find, being a very amateur photographer myself, I find to be my biggest challenge is to keep that light from mm -hmm. glaring and taking over the entire picture on me. <laughs> so, so, so fabulous work that you're doing. Um, very pleased that you're in the Hamilton area here and working with so many people you know, professionally in this region as well. And we look forward to seeing a lot more of your work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the you. show, Francis. Thank you. Quite welcome. So you can find him at fougere.ca. Yes. Yes. And uh, do you have a contact phone number where people can reach you? As sure. Well? It's 647-206-1583. Uh, and, get that and we'll but definitely we'll put that on the website as well. The website. And so people will also be able to get that off the website. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So my next guest this morning, well, it doesn't look like Dot High because it's Brian Owen this morning. And Brian's filling in for Dot. And Brian is the Communications and Marketing Director here at the Mountain Theatre. So welcome, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. How are good you morning. today? Thank you. Fine, thank you. That's good. Now, you guys just had a fabulous show this weekend. You had the Liverpool Four, wasn't it? Uh, Liverpool Four, a Beatles tribute. Yes. yes. It was a fantastic show. It was <laughs> our best show to date in terms of uh, attendance mm -hmm. and uh, the reception from the community. Uh, the lads from Liverpool really, really did a fine job. And uh, I mean, it went through all eras of uh, Beatle, Beatle music from the Ed Sullivan show, that's how the show began, actually, oh, uh, okay. right through the Shea Stadium mm -hmm. performance and then on to Sgt. Pepper's. So it was a, a great show. Uh, we had so many people uh, from the community out. Uh, the Red Tag Hatter ladies were out there. A big group of them. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, lo local artist, musician Jim Witter, his family was out. Uh, they mm -hmm. had a big group, and it was it was great because their their children were up dancing uh, by the stage area. Mm -hmm. The uh, the band just loved that as well too. Yeah. Uh, it was fantastic. And our and our local BIA was well re represented. Our co-chair Betty Toplick was here with a group from the BIA. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, and I know a lot of people were talking about that event coming up this past weekend. So there was a real buzz in the community about what was happening. 
Uh, so, but I know you guys do have a lot of other events that are coming up at the theater right now. Uh, so, so what have we got, Brian? Well, the thing that we were, we're focusing on, of course, with our, our talent buyer and booker, Ian Avalis, who's doing a fantastic job in getting local talent to the stage. It, it's starting with sort of one of our new uh, mottos or adages, uh, make, making a stage available for those who need a stage available. So, okay. mm -hmm. wh so what we're working with is with local groups, local talent. Uh, Ian's got a concert series that's actually beginning next Saturday with Racula, and that also includes Vivid Eye, Amber Fallen, and Monkeys with Machetes. <laughs> great names. Great, <laughs> great names. Uh, and, and this is leading up to, and that's the 21st, of yes. course. Uh, after that, there's a, a, a July 28th show, and that's with City of Snow, Shoulder the Blame, Slender Loris, and the Stingrays. Now this yeah. is all going to be leading up to an August 18th performance of Hamilton's own Teenage Head. Yes, yeah, and, are these, and these bands, of course, these are all local, aren't they? All local talent. Yeah. We are yeah. we are looking, of course, at more tribute acts and yeah. a mm -hmm. wide variety of, of, of musical acts, as yeah. well as theater, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, film screenings and a number of things. But when it comes to the local music, the local concert series right now, we're very proud of that. Ian's very proud of that because, as we, as we said, we want to make the stage available to those groups, uh, mm -hmm. whether they be musical groups or community groups, that yeah. would need a stage available. But we're focusing on that local talent. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the theater is open here through the week to groups that do want to use business that want to use it for webinars, um, different functions. You have a whole, a whole Wi-Fi uh, mm -hmm. available for people when they come in here too. I understand you used that just last week for a private function. Thank, thank you for mentioning that. Actually, yeah. that, uh, just to explain that quite a bit, uh, a little bit, I should say, is that was a, a group of organizations from the Hamilton Arts community. And we are exploring through a series of discussions uh, throughout the community, uh, expansion of the arts districts, expansion of arts and culture throughout mm -hmm. the area. Yeah. And what they did, or how they, how they actually do their meetings is through Twitter. So the, everybody came in compl uh, you know, with, with their devices, whether they be uh, notebook computers or uh, handheld mm -hmm. smartphones, and the whole meeting was actually tweeted out during the, the, the proceedings. And we were able to explore a lot, receive a lot of uh, feedback from the community about uh, the development of the arts community, uh, not only throughout the city in terms of the, uh, the geographic areas, but in this case we were focusing a lot on youth last in that last meeting. Uh, and that's fabulous. And of course you guys have had a lot of um, write-ups in local papers lately. We've had you in the Spectator, in the, in the Hamilton Mountain News, uh, and, and basically that's been the focus, is the arts and the community, right? Absolutely, and it's, yeah. it's not only just at the theater, because we're a part of, of everything that's happening, and right. uh, it, it's, it's throughout the, uh, the, our area here, the Concession Street Business Improvement Area, as well as the mountain in general, because this area is the gateway to the mountain, yes. and what we've found in past is, uh, whether it be shopping or whether it be the arts, Mountain people tend to stay on the mountain, and city people sometimes don't go off the mountain unless yeah. they may be heading to one of the large shopping centers. And now we're trying to, uh, you know, engage yeah. our, our locals as well as bring yeah. people from all around to yeah. the theater. Of course. Yeah, exactly. Just to change that way of thinking that yes, you can come to hell. <laughs> and, and right next to a, entertainment. <laughs> absolutely, and right next to a beautiful ecosphere or bios biosphere, how you want to look at it with the escarpment, we're yes. a block away from the edge of the mountain, mm -hmm. and you can walk for a, a good kilometer of park area. Yeah. And beautiful. That's fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. You can find out more information at HamiltonMountainTheater.com. Thank you. Now, you can be a guest on Pick Talk TV, live from Hamilton or live from Niagara. Now, we're also looking at a live from Halton show um, in the Burlington region starting in the fall. Um, so, it's free for any business organization, community-minded uh, individual in the Golden Horseshoe region to come on the show. You can put in your application for Pick Talk TV. We also do have sponsor spots that are available. And so just come on to the website, picktalktv.com, and get yourself some more information. So a quick thank you to, to Jill, to Andrea, and to Francis and to Brian for coming on the show today. Thank you also to our sponsors for Pick Talk TV, the Hamilton Mountain Theatre, the Niagara-on-the-Lake Community Centre, Venting Creatively, and Dr. PC. I'm Marie Mushing. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>